Hello everyone, my name is Anthony Shivkumar and in today's video I want to talk about the Zephyr RTOS. Now I have been starting to be a really big fan of it and it took me a while to actually get used to it and I was introduced mostly because I was working on the Nordic Semi development boards and by default they use the Zephyr RTOS and in the beginning I was wondering why do they have a, such a complicated setup to get started because the Zephyr RTOS has a lot of internal tools uh, in order for you to get started working and if you don't know what to do with them or what they mean because they're kind of unconventional compared to other projects in the embedded systems world where things are a little bit more straightforward in terms of say for example if you're just you know writing a bare metal driver you can literally take in you know an example from the actual uh, vendor without any operating system and write your project and it will be pretty easy to get started but as you add in complexity and if your application starts to grow that's where there's a bottleneck so it's easy to get started in most development boards when you just do bare metal programming and that was not the case with working with Zephyr and the RTOS and Nordic Semi and it was a slightly I won't say a steep learning curve but it took me there's a lot of new things that if you're not used to that are not very common in the embedded world but they're very common if you're working with the Linux kernel but not everybody works on the Linux kernel things like device trees things like you know project.conf things like kconfig um, just even using like CMake list instead of uh, or CMake instead of using just the, you know the uh, normal uh, make file systems um, that most you know projects use so all of these additional layers makes it a little bit difficult to get into the Zephyr RTOS but once you start to unravel each of the onion layers it starts to make sense as to why it's designed that way and then that's when I started to realize the the beauty in the complexity rather and it's and now when I think about it it's not necessarily complex if you understand all the details but there are many details to understand and that's what makes it complex so in this video I just want to break down few of those details so that it's it's and it's mostly an introductory video on to Zephyr RDOS because at the end of the day if you're working with this operating system it is highly recommended to have an actual physical board um, have a physical board that's compatible with the Zephyr RTOS uh, it would really make a huge difference in un really understanding the the pieces that goes into making this operating system work for you. All right, so let's get started. So I've created a small little slide on the Zephyr RTOS, and I think it's uh, more or less uh, an introductory video. So um, there are a lot of things I'll be missing, uh, or, or rather not including into this in this video. But it's more about you know getting your um, getting you know. Um, your feet wet kind of a thing so why the Zephyr RTOS one of the th the reasons behind the Zephyr RTOS uh, is that it's a small scalable open source operating system or real-time operating system and it works very well in embedded systems for example it works really well if you're using it on the um, you know Nordic semis as I mentioned over here uh, these are Cortex M33 processors, but they are not super, you know, they don't have tremendous computational capabilities. They're pretty powerful in its own sense, uh, but they work, you know, for, with Cortex 3, Cortex M, Cortex 3, Cortex 4, M3, M4, uh, and the M33, a lot of the uh, machine, um, now what do you say, the Cortex M series processors uh, can be compatible uh, or Zephyr can run on them. And it also supports a multitude of architectures. So you can use it on the ARM, you can use it on the x86, the ARC, the RISC-V, and Extensa, and etc. Um, which I will be, you know, working on when I'm working on another processor, which is uh, mostly most of them have ARM and Extend, and I think the few NXP devices have the Extensa um, um, architecture as well. And you can run. Um, Zephyr RTOS on this, but I think the most important amongst all of this is that. It supports multiple boards like it supports I think 450 boards which means that today if you're buying any any development board or getting into the embedded system realm and you want to get started most likely you will find that the Zephyr RTOS can be compatible with that board 
uh, especially if it has uh, enough capabilities. Now, I, I don't think it'll work on the Arduino Uno, but if you're using something that has, you know, a Cortex M3, M4 kind of capability, you're most likely looking at, you know, a Zephyr should be able to be supporting, should be able to be supported, uh, at least from a computational standpoint. And that's the why, like it supports tremendous amount of vendors, um, and there, there's more to it in terms of you know port code compatibility and all that stuff, which I'll be getting down and getting to in this video. Uh, before I dive into the folder structure, because I'm going to take this example from the example that I actually did in the previous video about you know uh, trying to you know get program your drone from the grounds up, and I'm using the Nordic Semi, and this was my folder structure basically, and it's it shouldn't it matter whether I'm presenting a drone or anything of that sort. This should be pretty um, agnostic to the application. Uh, but one more thing I want to mention about the Zephyr RTOS is when we get into the, into the device tree section and why it's designed in this very complex way. The most important aspect about this about this operating system is that once you program the specific hardware stuff, like very specific, you know, what way which pin and port is connected to. You're multiplexing which pin and which port based on the hardware for a specific feature whether it's SPI, I2C or whatever be it and you've done the hardware side of things so that it's compatible with that board the application is very portable across all um, the supported devices that Nordic support uh, or, or uh, Zephyr supports I won't say completely but at least for the most part like for example if your board supports Bluetooth and another board doesn't support Bluetooth then you won't be able to you know port the Bluetooth capabilities but if you know one supports I2C and the other supports I2C, uh, you can port the application of that particular protocol, um, and all you have to do is change certain you know device uh, parameters in order for it to be compat um, in order for it to work. But the application that's running on top of it uh, becomes agnostic, and you can just easily port it. And I think that's one of the strongest reason is that it separates the hardware from the actual application, making your code a lot more reusable, which we'll get to in shortly. Now, this folder structure is based on my working with the Nordic Semi uh, system. Uh, but one of the things that I want to talk about is um, you'll have a very similar structure in terms of um, designing any embedded devices. You'll have your source pro you'll have your source file or your source folder, which will have the main.c, which is which will have you know your void main or int main function, and from there everything starts to run. And then you'll have certain parameters that that's that's where you know the Zephyr RTOS um, complexity starts to you know take its hold. In a sense, you'll have things like kconfig, which comes from the you know comes from the it's called kernel config, but it comes from uh, Linux kernel, which uses uh, the kconfig, and you can configure certain kernel parameters by using um, the menu config uh, GUI and stuff like that. I'm not going to go more into the go touch too much of the kconfig because in my application I really haven't touched the kconfig in order for me to make it work. It uses CMake. This is when you want to basically add a new file, a new folder, and you want it to compile. You'll change some parameters or add some, uh, you know, some information into the CMake list to say, you know, please compile this file. You'll have something called as boards, uh, which basically is if you have a folder called boards and then you basically have an overlay file in here. You can have your overlay file anywhere, but it's just, you know, in terms of, you know, keeping your code um, cleaner, you can have, you know, the board, uh, what do you say, a folder, and then you could use the same application with multitudes of boards if you want. Uh, but in this case, so I could have the NRF, you know, overlay file, and what it would do, it would overlay it would overwrite the default configuration that would come with, say, the default if you buy the board and, and Nordic Semi's, um, you know, default um, hardware configuration. For example, they might say pin 33 is configured as a GPIO and you're like, no, I want pin 33 to be configured for my I2C. That's when you'll write an overlay file because you want to overwrite certain parameters that was set by default and now you're customizing it to your application. So that's what an overlay file does. And this is, with it, this is the power of... Um, the whole Zephyr RTOS is that you set up these uh, things in these device tree files. They call DTS files. Um, but an overlay, an overlay extension is basically overlaying or overwriting the um, DTI files, which is the device tree files uh, of the um, of the of the board. 
and it's not just the board it's basically the, of the processor but you're generally configuring it for your custom board or in or a, or a you know a board that you would that you would buy a development board and this is where the power is where you can basically you could i could have you know multiple boards i could have an nxp board i could have a stm microcontroller board and i could use you know different board setups over here and and i could compile it for those different boards and i wouldn't have to change anything in the application logic if they're compatible if all the features of each board is compatible with each other for example they all have bluetooth they all have you know i square c spi whatever be it then i could be agnostic and just change these overlay files for the specific boards and it would work that's at least the idea in an ideal situation but generally it's not uh, it's not necessarily always smooth but that's uh, very but it's very possible using the setup and here you have the gpios pwm these are all at the application layer and i was just a good folder structure to separate your drivers and then if you're using you know certain sensors you would have a different you know a nested folder the project configuration file or folder or, or file basically is basically saying a Zephyr RTOS supports many, many modules and not all those modules needs to be compiled when you're you know, programming for your development board. For example, it might support Bluetooth, but your um, board doesn't even have Bluetooth. So, you're, so you can tell you know, Zephyr RTOS when you're compiling saying don't compile and link the Bluetooth library because I don't need it and my board is not compatible with it. So let's save some space. Uh, I don't need that to be compiled in my binary. Or you know, your board might say, or you're just using like say maybe only GPIOs and, and, and you're not even using any other features of your board. So you can so you can basically say disable the I2C you know, um, link uh, files. You can disable the, I, uh, the SPI, disable all the other parameters you don't actually say disable only if you include them then they're enabled but if they're not included then they by default disable so you're basically configuring your system and you're compiling your code in such a way that you're only asking for the things that you need so that you're not having a bloated application or a bloated um, you know uh, file running on your embedded system you just want to save space so let's dive a little deeper into the device tree now Let's recap on what I said and go a little bit more deeper. Now, the Zephyr RTOS uses something called as a device tree to configure the hardware. Very similar to even the Linux system. If you're just defining any hardware for the for the Linux system, you will be they have a concept called as device tree. So this is coming very much from Linux, and it is nothing but a data structure that describes the hardware components of a particular microcontroller. In this particular case so that the kernel can use and manage those components including the clock the memory the peripheral pins and ports so in a nutshell it's just a very simple data structure that describes hardware components i mean uh, and you have this in this one file it's normally called as the dts file which is the device tree source file or you could have the dtsi file which is the device tree uh, source include file the dti and what are the features of the device tree one it the main the core app usefulness of it is it abstracts application from the hardware so i could have the same application and my application be running kalman filtering it could be running some pid controller it could be running all of these you know maybe you know deciphering and, and working with uh, a particular um, a sensor and that's all part of the application now the sensor might be using an i square c protocol that's also an apps that's also part of the application now which pin the i square c uses that will be part of the hardware and that will be abstracted using the using the device tree. And because of this, it allows for easy porting of applications to different hardware. And if you're porting code, you're able to reuse code, right? I mean, a lot of benefits for it. It keeps the code clean and definitely readable because of the fact that you're abstracting the hardware part of it and the hardware is generally in this as i mentioned in an overlay file and it's you're not you know mixing and and, and and writing all these ports and pins you could do that but you could technically you know do that in any part of your code if you want but you don't want that and you and if you just follow you know the best practice of writing uh code in the zephyr rtos um by using zephyr rtos you most likely will keep all the hardware definitions in a very specific file for example in the boards directory or something of that sort and you wouldn't include that anywhere else um, in your source file because that should be pre-compiled during the Zephyr build process it'll pre-compile a DTS file into uh, a macro file that will be used uh, 
into these macros and header files during the build process and those will be used to uh, basically um, read all the device uh, or hardware specific code and it's all pre-compiled into uh, a C you know header file and a C file that's used so you don't have to rewrite any of those things because the Zephyr compiler which uses the Viz, the West build comp West build tool which is specific to the Zephyr build system um, will will generate that code for you so it keeps very much your code clean and readable which basically means you're only writing application code for the most part so let's take an example of what this really looks like because all what I've spoken about might be you know, a little bit too complex so what I'm going to do is basically take an example of my I'm just going to take my screen right now and I'm going to show you the BLE drone over here. Actually, I should, you know, I could even take you to GitHub, but I will show you in this system in my visual code editor because it will be much easier. And as you can see over here, we have uh, this is the BLE drone file. And in here, I have uh, the boards directory. And in the boards directory, I have the pin control and this and the overlay file. So let's go a little bit deeper into this overlay file. So if I click on the PWM LED, uh, not this one, just give me a minute. Uh, if I go over here and just click on this will take me to the landing files and I believe it is in and this will take me to yeah so when you install this particular um when you use the nordic uh nrf sdk by default it'll tell you to it'll just you know use uh, this particular layout it'll tell you you know i'm using pin zero and my pin control and let's actually you know what let me just open the where this folder is on my um let me just go over here and click in yeah so actually no i have the wrong folder okay so this is the development file and when you install the nrf sdk it'll take you it'll install it in using the nrf 2.4 sdk zephyr board arm or dex you know whatever be it and what i'm going to do is i am going to yeah so it's going to be a little tricky but we'll try our best all right so in here you'll see that this is where all the the dts files are, are configured for the nrf5340 nrf has you know multiple processors they could have the nrf52 series the nrf53 series the 54 series the seven something series or whatever be it so what this is saying is basically saying i i want to overlay the nrf5340 development kit because that's what i'm using and i'm overwriting things defined in the cpu common DTS. DTS stands for device G source. So let's have a look at this file. And in here, it's basically saying I'm using the PWM zeros. For example, the pulse width modulation is using pin control zero and one. And let's figure out what pin is configured for what. So then we'll have the pin control. And this is an include file. DTSI stands for device G source include. And in here, it basically will have the PWM zero. And the PWM0 is now connected to port 0, pin 28. So by default, if I want to use PWM from as soon as I buy the NRF, for, you know, the NRF um, 5340, if I buy this board and I want to configure pin and don't do anything and just, you know, take an example and just, you know, download and put it to my code, to my, to this board, it is going to use pin 0, 28. The port 0, um, pin 28 but now that i'm compiling a drone i need four pin four you know outputs for people with modulation and i want to want to use port zero you know pin 28 because uh, i'm probably I'm configuring it for something else how do i overwrite this this is where an overlay file comes into the picture now this is common to this repository which is part of the nrf sdk and now i'm basically saying hey that's pretty cool but I don't really need the configuration, the default configuration you have set because it doesn't work for my application. That's when I write an overlay file and say, I want to overwrite all of that. 
and I want to configure four PWMs, your default only configures one PWM. So I'm going to have my using my, my, I'm going to use PWM zero, which has four channels. And I'm going to configure channel zero, channel one, channel two, and channel three. I'm going to name it as a PWM LED zero, PWM LED one, PWM LED two, PWM LED three. Why I've named it, named it as LED because I've been lazy, I've been lazy and I'm just over, and I'm just using the conventions that were basically, um, defined in the default file and here I've defined an overlay file and here I'm saying include this overlay file because I am now defining which pin will be connected to this PWM and in here I'll have my PWMs which will be the PWM which is port uh, which is for the PWM 0 and in PWM 0 I'm now telling that I have different channels and PWM out 0 will now be connected to port 1 pin 6 PWM, PWM zero channel one channel zero is connected to port one port uh, pin six channel one is connected to port one pin seven channel two is connected to port one channel uh, pin eight and channel three is connected to port one pin nine. And now I'm overwriting the the this um, all these pins. Uh, I'm configuring the pin to work for me by overwriting them and the way I overwrite them is by using by is by using is by basically placing them in the boards directory and in here I'm basically using the same name as this so, so it's going to be the NRF CPU instead of common I am basically putting the board name NRF 5340DK with the NRF 5340 CPPU CPU a application and then I put dot overlay and the cool part is that Zephyr is automatically be able to pick this up because it's basically trying to um, yeah I'm basically copying something of this sort so this will basically copy this from the Nordic uh, is using the common the common device resource and the common device resource is now using this uh, whatever be it by adding an extension of overlay with the same name as the original file which is picking up from the device tree it'll be able to capture the it'll be able to catch or you know use that overlay file in order to overwrite all of this configuration and then it'll use this one it's pretty cool actually so if this is the default for my pin 0 I've select I'm overwriting this in my pin control over here and it's overwritten for all the four channels and I'm using all the four channels that's what it does and I configured many other things not just PWM I've configured for you know for certain general purpose input output pins I've configured for um, the SPI pin and f and I've also configured certain things to be an output certain things to be an input and these are generally what I've basically configured for PWM SPI and these are specific to the sensor that I'm using and some switches over here that was default and that's really uh, how you define a device tree and that's an example of an overlay file some handy notes an overlay file in your repository will overwrite the default configuration of the device tree as I mentioned a dot DTSI file means it's an include file because it has an I extension over here Placing the overlay file under the boards directory will be automatically picked up by the Zephyr RTOS device tree compiler. As I mentioned, those DTSI files will be compiled into um, the actual source code. So let's have a look at what I mean by that. So in the builds directory, if you look at it, once I build it, the Zephyr RTOS will now build all of this and it will be built into, um, yeah, it will build it's basically going to compile this DTSI file into an actual C file. So yeah, there's a DTS make file, which is, you know, doing all the, f configuring all the things. And then under the driver, I believe, if not driver, that goes to the board, under board, it'll go to the NRF um, 5340 because it's building that. And here it's built the linker. So dot A is basically uh, the compile, but it's a library. And somewhere in here, I believe it does create a source file. Let's see if I'm not mistaken. And if yeah, it's probably it's probably cleaned up all the .c file. 
yeah so it's created a, a dot a file basically a library that it can link um, it's probably cleans it up once it builds it but yeah that's what it's done it's basically taken all of this information and compiled it into a dot a file which is nothing but a shared library or a you know static library in this particular case all right let's get back to our slide And this is very important. In order for it to pick up, it needs to be. It's good to have the file name match the default DTS, which in this case was the you know NRF five three four zero underscore development kit underscore NRF NRF five three four zero whatever be it dot overlay file. Because then that's when it'll pick up the dot. Then that's when it'll automatically pick up the overlay file. You can otherwise you'll have to explicitly state that in your in your in your in your build project configuration. So next thing that we'll move into is a CMake list, which is agnostic. It does it's not very specific to Zephyr at all. Uh, CMake is another build tool that you could use instead of um, Make, um, and uh, and yeah, I mean it's um, it's a build tool. So in order for you to like you know add all the different if you have if you want to structure your fold your your application in a much more streamlined and user friendly way you're probably going to have different folders and different folders will have different files and so on and so forth and if you want to compile it you basically put target source and then you add in these files and it'll work so let me show you an example into the in the repository again so for example in here i have i have in my source file i have for the drivers i've set up some 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 folders in the pwm i've set up some folders then i have some sensors which is the um you know which is the seva fsm 400 and i uh, 5300 and i want to basically compile all of it so in my cmake list file i have basically added all of the all of the source files that i need in order for this particular project to compile so that's what a cmake file does It's basically saying i want I, i've structured my folder structure this way Please pick up these files and compile them. That's really it. It's simple, but it's super hand handy, and that's you could do that even through Makefile. See, Makelist, I think, is got it's got it's got a better user experience in my opinion, but uh, nothing too complex. Now we have the project.conf file, which is a very specific to uh, Zephyr RTOS. And the project.conf file is a configuration file that is used to configure the kernel and the application. It is a text file that contains a list of key value pairs. The key is the name of the configuration option and the value is the value of the configuration option. For example, config GPIO is equals to Y. As I mentioned, the Zephyr RTOS could come up with, you know, let's have a look over here again. In the source file, when we build in here, if you go to the modules, you can build all of this, right? Like. Uh, let me just check how oh, you're not modules i believe it's in drivers zephyr um yeah drivers you could build all of this if you want you could build the bluetooth you could build you know flash gpio i square c mbox pcie pin control pwm serial spi timer and your project doesn't probably need any of this it just needs probably gpio that's it and there is no point for you to like you know build all of this unnecessarily when it's not necessary right it's just not necessary so what you wanted to do is basically say hey zephyr i don't want you to build usb c i don't want you to build usb i need timers because my pwm relies on timers i'm using spi so so please print spi so that's where you see it's built the library for this is build the library for this is build the PWM because we use build PWM. We use pin control. I don't use PCIe, so there's no .dot a file. So whichever I've configured to use, it's compiled to .dot a file. And how do I configure all of this? I configure this in the project .dot um, project .dot uh, what do you say um, project project file. <laughs> so in here, when I go over here, this is let me just you know close some of the folders in the project .dot con file. I set this up. I said, please, conf please basically compile the GPI of, of Zypher, the serial, the Bluetooth configuration, you know, the logging, the PWM, the I square C, the SPI, and that's all it's compiled. It's not compiled everything that I need that, that Zephyr offers. I only compile the things that I need. I don't need PCIe. I don't need disk. I don't 
flash yeah because you want to flash the driver um, console clock control so all the things that I need is compiled and those things that I don't need don't compile it that's what the project conf basically does for you it's a very super handy way of basically telling Zypher or telling the build system only compile the things that I need and not everything and don't blow you know make this gigantic file that's not necessary now when you're using an RTOS there has to be some uh, it has to be some benefits other than just organizing code there's got to be some benefits in terms of you know making it multiprocessing and that's why you have an RTOS because you want to do certain and multiple things at the same time the Zephyr RTOS uses threads to run multiple tasks simultaneously. Threads are lightweight processes that share the same memory space and can be scheduled to run on the same CPU core. So let's give an example of what a thread is. And what a thread is is basically saying that, hey, I have Bluetooth. Um, I, ha I want to receive information through Bluetooth. I want to send information through Bluetooth. I want to you know, pro process my PID controller. I want to basically um, you know, um, have a thread constantly reading sensor information from my sensors. And I want to feed that to the PID controller, you know, and all those, you know, crazy things that you want. And you want to have, have all those these things at least appear to be ha happening simultaneously. That's what threads do. They basically, you know, uh, time slice and do, do, they do a lot of context switching. Um, in reality, it's all sequential, but because they're happening at, a, you know, 120 megahertz or whatever is the clock frequency and a very high speed, you're basically time slicing and context switching and and that's able to automatically you know do all the scheduling the tasking and you know and synchronization is done by the a kernel and the rtos and from an application standpoint it just seems that they're all working in concurrently or you know simultaneously so how do you define a thread the thread is defined using the symbol called the k-thread define you have a thread id stack size thread function and you have all of these parameters when you define a thread. Let's dive a little deeper into what these parameters are. So you're just naming the thread, it could be any name. You wanna set the size of the stack, you know, set it to defaults. Um, uh, you can take examples of what your vendor might provide so that you could, you know, stick to that size. Thread function is now when the function, when the thread is called, what function do you want it to call? And once you have that called, what arguments do you wanna to pass to it? What is the priority of the thread? The higher the priority, if the priority is seven and the one thread has got a priority of seven and the other and one thread has got a priority of eight, the the thread with the priority eight will generally um, always um, run. If it's got some task to work on, it'll always try to complete that task first before it goes to a lower priority task. You have certain options and then you have something called as delay to start. So an example of this would be. Here, I want to have a thread. Thread ID could be literally how you define it over here. I want my stack size to be 102 for kilobytes. That's my thread function. Null, 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 and my priority is five. Simple. Let's take an example of a real code. I'm just going to, you know, go over here and go to my main file. Let's go to source main.c. And in here, I basically divided, you know, come you know uh, initialize few threads I've got a float test I want to test some floating point arithmetic I have something called as process command thread I have a Bluetooth write thread and I've got a thread for um, you know uh, reading information from uh, the sensor from the IMU sensor so the process command thread is receiving information from the Bluetooth and this write thread is basically sending information from uh, from the particular host to another um, Bluetooth device. So you'll have different threads and this is how I've defined it. And I have each one as a pretty much the same priority and if they have the same priority, they basically work uh, the same way they're, they're time sliced equally. But you'll notice that in each of these threads, so for example over here, there's something called as k-yield. And k-yield is basically saying, well, if you finish this first loop, then yield to the other thread. Because if you don't put k-yield, then that one thread will only dominate because there's nothing to yield. It's very similar to the BSD way of operating system. The Linux doesn't, you don't have to put yield when you're doing, you know, Linux threading. But if you're doing BSD threading, you'll have to put the yield option. And if you don't yield, uh, you'll be basically blocking um, all the other threads from functioning. So that's one of the things that you've got to be aware of when you're doing uh, multi-threaded applications in Zephyr. You've got to yield.
<laughs> if you want to debug, use printk. It's a lifeline for debugging in Zephyr. You, you know, it's everything you're going to debug. At least at the beginning, when you're getting started, you just want to printk everything. Uh, not 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 the best way of to learn programming, but uh, or you know learn an operating system, but it's it's pretty much becomes your lifeline. So the print messages to the console we use the print k function. It's very similar to the print fee function, print f function in C. The print k is you know I think it's called print kernel function is a thread safe and can be called from any thread. It's a super handy function for debugging. So um, if you're debugging, you're going to use print k. It's uh, everywhere, you know, it, you'll be you know, sprinkling it all over your code just because it's such a handy tool for you to debug whether you're operating, whether your application code using the Zephyr RTOS works properly. That's pretty much it. I've come to the end. The details I did not cover. I did not cover the best build system because technically speaking, you know, um, if I'm using the Nordic Semi, I just literally, literally just click build and it's doing all the building for me. I'm not, you know, going into the details of the device recompiler. You know, this is very much if you're, you know, wanting to understand how the compiler actually works with the device tree. Uh, definitely, I'm not going to cover that. And because I've actually rarely touched the kconfig file, I don't know much about it. I haven't covered it. Like for my application, I know there's a lot of step few settings that are probably might help, but I've not really touched it. I've not felt the need to, you know, have an overlay kconfig as such. So I'm not too sure whether, you know, at least for an application of building a drone, I'm pretty sure these things make sense. Yeah, I guess, you know, you're defi if you're, you're defining the uh, stack size for your thread, um, you're defining your buffer size and some certain things, but I'm not really had to change some of these default settings. That's in a nutshell an introduction to Zephyr RTOS. It's uh, become my new favorite tool on the block for embedded systems. It's I feel I'm, I'm, I I love this a lot more than free RTOS for whatever reason. Um, I think it's because it's just more open. It's got a much more cleaner infrastructure in terms of you know de separating the hardware from the software and from the application. The hardware soft, the hardware side of things, um, it's abstracting that from the application and it's to me you know it's uh, it's it's won my heart. Um, um, uh, superbly. So I'll be, you know, um, talking a lot more about the Zephyr RTOS. Uh, I highly recommend you try it out as well. And, uh, you know, if you like what I did, you know, please like, please subscribe. Hope, you know, this could be, in, this is informative. It's an introductory video, but I've also, you know, tried to share, you know, some of the code that, you know, that basically complements and supplements the presentation that I gave so that, you know, there's, uh, there's more, um, um, what do you say real examples behind it and yeah and I highly recommend you you know to try it out yourself so um, do subscribe do like and until next time please take care